Um, thanks for the introduction. And it's my honor to join Dr. Yafi, uh, Yafi Martin's team. And um, I'll share some study results from my PhD research studies. Sorry. Hello. Sorry for that. Yeah, no problem. And um, here is the hospital institute that I work in the past five years. And uh, this is where I graduated the Western University. And my talk is about the prostate cancer, and we're trying to find cancer on the record prostatectomy tissue sections. Uh, here shows the background of the record prostatectomy. Um, that uh, is a surgery that removes the entire prostate, and the tissue is being cut and stained with hematoxylin and eosin, um, put on the microscope for pathology examination, which generates the text-based pathology report. The report is read by re referring physician for prognosis and predicting recurrence for the patient, and it can also be used for uh, the guidance of follow-up treatment as well as pathological research. So in the text report, it's not um, the pathologist are not only annotating the presence of uh, prostate cancer, but also indicating the aggressive uh, aggressiveness of the uh, of the tumor based on this Gleason grading system, which breaks down the tumor. Uh, into five uh, different grades. And uh, uh, we can, clinically, we consider the Gleason 1 to 3 as a low grade, and 4 and 5 as, uh, as a high grade. Also, I've listed um, those features which are crucial to report and are being used in clinical practice. Uh, first one is Gleason score of the RP sections. Um, the Gleason score is being calculated by summation of the primary uh, summation of the Gleason grade of a primary and a secondary of the tumor. And using this Gleason score, um, we, we can stratify the patient into five grade groups, as I listed over here. However, in clinical practice, it, it is challenging for the uh, physicians or pathologists to stratify that for the borderline cases, because to differentiate the one, two, three grade groups, we need uh, the estimation of the presence of percentage of the Gleason grade four, and a similar situation happened to differentiate a grade group of four and five, and therefore, and um, it is recommended to have uh, a quantitative reporting of Gleason grade four and five. Um, in addition, um, although the tumor volume reporting is not in clinical practice, uh, however, uh, in the consensus meeting of ISUP meeting. Uh, most of pathologists believe that tumor volume is, is a very important feature to report, and it's recommended to have a quantitative reporting, um, as well as uh, there's a uh, recent re interest in uh, showing that the study showing uh, the presence of intradactyl carcinoma and uh, the creep brief form, the G4, and uh, showing a different prognostic outcome. So. It needs further studies as well as random control trials to be proved that those are uh, those can can be used for uh, for routine clinical reporting. However, um, the annotation on those subtypes is not in the routine clinic practice, and it, if we do this kind of study, it requires a substantial extra effort from the pathologist. So ideally, if we have a graphic reporting, as I show over here, have each of the tumor annotated and the, the grade uh, graded by different color of the contour, it is easy for us to have this uh, quantitative information for each of the tumors, as, as you can see here. This would be able to potentially re re resolve all the clinical challenges and the benefit to the clinical application. Therefore, there's an unmet need uh, for a software system that will be able to identify, locate grade cancerous regions on the RP sections and validate on a large data set. So our objective is to develop and validate such a system. I break down our objective into three specific aims, uh, including cancer detection, which is finding the cancer on the RP section. The second step would be uh, grade the cancerous regions based on the Gleason grading system. And the third step would further grade uh, the cancerous region beyond the Gleason grading system uh, into subtypes. 
So there are some challenges in our field. Uh, it's being well known that for the digital pathology processing, and uh, there's a major challenge of a large amount of data to process, especially for our case for the video clean and home monitor section. And as you, you can see, it is scanned at a very high resolution. And this example image has 4.8 billion pixels into three color channels. And we zoom in and we can see the detail of those tissues and our pathologist the annotations. And further zoom in, we can see those tissues at a cellular level. And we can see the meticulously done pathologist the annotation wrapper around the uh, tumor boundary. And this uh, annotation is all done by our trained physician. Um, and all, the, all of the control is verified by one of uh, our geopathologists. And uh, for each uh, patient case, it takes about 70 working hours to finish. And another challenge would be the homogeneous of the tissue patterns. Uh, I've listed three examples of the normal <laughs> tissue and the cancerous tissue, as you can see over here. And by the layman's perspective, it's probably very, um, very obvious for the expert to see the difference between those tissue samples. However, however for the, by the layman's perspective, it is very hard to tell uh, the difference between the normal tissue and uh, the high, uh, and the cancerous tissue. So it, it is also hard for the system to tell them from each other. A third challenging, major challenge in our field would be the stain variability. Although the tissue is being cut and processed at, at our one local center followed by exactly the same protocol, and we use a robotic stain in our center, um, the staining variability is obvious, as you can see, and if we zoom in, we can see the standard variability is even more obvious. So for the first um, specific aim for the cancer detection, here shows the material we used. We used a 299 home on tissue sections from 71 patients. It includes 1.3 million uh, 480 by 480 regions of interest, and all the images were mainly annotated by our geopathologist, as, as I mentioned previously. And, um, how we do um, our method, including to parsonate the middle gland host light image into the re uh, a set of region of interest that you can see the grid as show here, and the size of 480 by 480 micron. And uh, what we want to do is we want to have a system be able to uh, differentiate each of a region of interest as cancer versus non-cancer. Therefore, we would be able to map out the entire host light image to show the cancerous region. We use a data set um, here, here, and this diagram shows the, how we split the data that we have uh, 71 patients and uh, split into tuning data set and the validation data set. Uh, in the tuning data set, we use three patients, whereas all the rest of the patients that we use for uh, cross validation and to make sure the validation data set is independent to the tuning data set. And we use the following classifiers, uh, is conventional machine learning based approach, as well as we use a deep learning based approach to develop the system. And we use cross validation and group the patient on, um, group the data on per patient basis to make sure that the um, samples from uh, training and testing are from, from different patient. So here is a high level diagram to illustrate how, uh, to illustrate our system pipeline. We have a stack of host light images uh, with a pathology annotation, and uh, we extract the samples of cancer and non-cancer tissues uh, from, based on pathology annotation. Then we use our proposed tissue component segmentation to segment, uh, to label each of the pixel as uh, nuclei showing the red here and uh, Lumia map, the Lumia label in blue, and combine these two label maps into three class tissue components map that has uh, labeled the nuclei, uh, labeled the luminal area, and uh, the rest of the tissue as a stroma or other tissue components. The reason why we want to do that is in our pre previous study, we found um, um, Proportion of the presence of stroma, lumin, nucleus reflected the presence and the absence of prostate cancer. Therefore, we think if we would be able to identify each of the tissue components, uh, we probably can uh, quantify their uh, 
uh, quantify those tissue components and use that for detecting cancer. Um, how, uh, for the segmentation of those tissue components uh, comes to the challenge that I mentioned earlier of the staining variability. And uh, we use the color deconvolution, which is, a, which is a method that can separate the hemotoxin and the eosin stain. And you can see the result of uh, um, gray level imaging. This is, um, mm, this is uh, a hemotoxin channel and showing that uh, if you have very large amount of hemotoxin stain, you will show much darker, whereas if you have very small amount of hemotoxin stain, you will show much lighter. And you can see these highlights uh, and the presence of the nuclei. However, because of the staining variability, you can see the large intensity variability in these two gray level image. So thresholding algorithm is not applicable to segment the nuclei out. For example, you can see and the intensity of a stroma tissue over here is probably close to the nuclei over here. Therefore, we develop an, uh, an, an algorithm that can automatically uh, selecting a, thre a threshold for, uh, for the segmentation uh, that we published earlier. And you can see that despite of the staining variability, we can have a consistent and accurate segmentation of the nuclei, as you can see here. And then we use a we use the global thresholding to threshold the numinal region that is nearly white, as you, you can see here, and then assign the rest of the pixel as a stroma or other tissue components. So that's how we do the segmentation. And then we extracted the texture features uh, to quantify those, um, the three class tissue components maps to generate the features. And then um, we use the tuned parameter data, which is tuned by our tuning data set, and then we have the system trained, uh, as you can see here. We also use the deep learning-based approach with uh, transfer learning using pre-training at extent uh, with raw image data set that have the at extent trained by raw image. And here's uh, some, some background of Alex, sorry, AlexNet. Uh, AlexNet is a, is a and deep learning based approach that is being uh, that demonstrate a excellent performance in 2010 imaging classification challenging uh, it, it was trained by 1.2 million images and classified them into a thousand classes and as you can see the AlexNet is being trained by these everyday life images and we worry if we can use the print trained AlexNet and tune by our uh, our samples and use that to differentiate the uh, non-cancer from cancer tissue. And we also use the input of our different tissue components maps. For example, the nuclei map and the NUMI map, as well as our three class tissue components maps. So here shows the result of our LIV1 patient across validation with seven different um, methods. And here shows error rate false negative rate, false positive rate, and AUC. And uh, different color tone represents the method using different, uh, using different method. And we can see the blue tone bars represents the method of conventional machine learning based approach, whereas um, the orange or red tone bars uh, represents the method using deep learning based approach. And the overall performance can be uh, seen as a non-parametric uh, metric of uh, the AUC that we can see for the conventional machine learning based approach, we achieved AUC of 4.92, while the deep learning achieved a better performance as the numbers show here. And the deep learning uh, fine-tuned by our tissue component map achieved the AUC of 0.97, which is the best performing classifier, and followed closely by Alex Nader trained by raw image, uh, which is 0.96, it's very close here. Uh, in terms of overall performance. We also want to know for each of the method, uh, we break down that by tissue types. We want to know um, each of the method, how weird they can detecting them as a cancer for different tissue types. So here we have the positive sample of all cancerous tissue show here, and those are uh, uh, non cancerous tissue show here, and those bars represent the error rate in the detection for each of the types, as well as the similar to, to the healthy tissues. 
so you, you, we can see the healthy tissue uh, category uh, that uh, Alex and I trained by raw images. You can see the light is the red tone bar. It's the logiest one, and that represents it performs the best. Uh, be able to classify those tissues as uh, negative, which is a non-cancer. And uh, in comparison, we found uh, for those tissue types have a G5 involved cancers. Um, this method, Alex Natural by Roy Image, actually have the high gauge, not high gauge, but a pretty high error rate, as you can see. In comparison, sorry. And in comparison, those two methods of Alex Natural by TCM and the nuclei, they have relatively much lower uh, error rate for G5 involved cancer. However, Gleason grade 5 cancer is most aggressive cancer, and we don't want to miss that. Um, uh, aggressive cancer tissue in clinical practice. And in this performance, probably we speculated it's probably related to the sample size we use. We found that for the sample size of non-cancer tissue, we have a much larger sample size, whereas for the G5 involved cancer, we have a much smaller sample size. Therefore, we we think the Alex and I trained by Roy image is probably very sensitive to the sample size and the tissue pattern. And again, I think I think this is just a repetitive slide that demonstrate what I just described earlier. And to illustrate those quantitative results, we also I just selected one sample, one case uh, of the qualitative results. And we have the non-cancerous tissue show in, in black region here. And the cancerous region, and this is a ground truth, by the way, and the cancerous region showing in white region and all the pathologies and annotation you can see wrapped around the cancerous region. And in comparison, and the ground truth, this is the system predicted cancer map, as you can see here. And this is Alex Nitrin by Roy Image. The gigantic tumor in this case is a five plus four, which is the high-grade cancer here. And we can see the system meets a tons of regions of high-grade cancer, despite it correctly labeled most of the healthy tissue in black, but the performance is uh, it meets a lot of high grade cancer, uh, and whereas we listed those different seven different methods as we can see in this label map, and we can see that as I mentioned in quantitative result, those methods achieve the much better performance as it barely meets high grade cancer. It's just a couple of spots, and it also correctly labeled healthy tissue in black, as you can see. So what we can conclude from the study is the performance of deep learning using and the raw images very sensitive to the sample size and the tissue types. And that the tissue component map encoded most of the cues and that enables the cancer detection and uh, yield a more robust and the consistent performance across different tissue types and the deep learning based approach generally outperform and the conventional machine learning based approach uh, when given a large sample size. Here's a table that I listed and to demonstrate our contribution to the field. I'm not trying to say we are the best, but it's just a comparison. Um, here are the previous studies. I highlighted one of the important that most of the people care about is the improvement of the performance. Those are the results. We demonstrate the state of our performance and uh, also in comparison, we care about the total amount of tissue using our study because for prostate cancer, um, prostate tissue is notorious uh, heterogeneous. So it is very important to use all the tissues without pre-selection, whereas most of studies use pre-selected ROIs. So for translation and application, I believe that's very important. And as well, we use the, um, all the available tissue from the largest sample size so far, uh, you might see some numbers are higher, but those are biopsy tissues as well as the tissue microarrays. And we achieved the highest, the fastest processing time for translational application. Move to the second specific aim is cancer grading. And just a reminder over here, we, we talk, I, I've talked about the like borderline cases that we want the per, reporting that a quantitative information of the presence of high grade cancer. In our experiment, we designed to differentiate high-grade versus low-grade 
So those are the common grades are Gleason grade four and five here, and the Gleason grade three. Just um, you, you probably remember in my previous uh, slides that are saying that uh, one to three is low grade. However, in clinical practice, it's very rare we have one to two. So normally we have three to five. So and three is a low grade, four and five is a high grade. And uh, again, to showing that, uh, sorry. So the major challenge for this problem is the homogeneous uh, across different grades that is very hard to differentiate as well as heterogeneous within the same grade. And uh, to be more specific, I have show some example here that uh, previously we are trying to differentiate normal tissue and uh, cancerous tissue. And in this case, we want to differentiate um, the low grade versus high grade. And as you can see, those tissue samples are more similar, which makes it harder to differentiate. As well as for the same Gleason grade, the example I show here is a Gleason grade four, that all those samples are Gleason grade four patterns. Um, and the system needs to be able to identify all of the patterns and correctly label them as a high grade. We use a previously proposed pipeline for cancer detection and we replace the samples of high grade and a low grade as a positive and a negative samples respectively uh, for this cancer grading problem. And uh, we uh, have a different uh, tuned hyperparameter in this case. Similarly, we have the error metrics showing in the bar chart over here. And uh, we have different error metrics as well as a different method. And we, we found similar performance, except that the Alex and I trained by uh, Lumi map uh, achieve a very poor performance in this case. And it is um, reasonable to see that because only de depends on the Lumi feature for grading is pretty pretty difficult. However, um, our method achieved a better performance and uh, overall performance achieved by Alex and I trained by tissue components map uh, of AUC of 0.92. And uh, similarly, we break down that by different tissue types. We have a positive samples here and a, ne a negative sample here, and those represents the error rate. And similarly, we can the Alex Knight trained by raw image actually has the highest error rate for uh, detection uh, of high grade has G5 involved cancer, whereas a TC uh, tissue components nuclei map tuned the Alex Knight has a better performance. Again, I feel like we speculate that is uh, related to the sample size. And here is the exactly the same example I picked for cancer detection. In this case, is for grading and all of the high grade should be labeled in white. And in this specific case, we don't have any low grade cancer. So based on the ground truth, all the maps are supposed to be labeled in white. And, and the low grade cancer is labeled in the gray, but this shouldn't be any gray. And here uh, the output by our system, we can see uh, the, the Alex natural baroy image actually labeled towns of uh, regions as, uh, as low grade showing in gray region over here. Whereas Alex Knight trained by TCM, Nuclei, and the Fisher Classifier actually uh, perform much better. So seeing the conclusion we can draw from the cancer grading, and in addition to that, we know that tissue component map uh, encode also the cue for cancer grading as well. And the contribution to the field um, is very similar. However, we, we want to see that um, from the early years of the study to the more recent study, we found the result is not necessarily improved. So the number actually sometimes dropped. And we also found that the total amount of a processed tissue is actually increased in terms of the uh, more, for the more recent studies. That proves that people are starting to pay attention to using validating on larger sample size. Whereas our study is, is use a larger scale of data set and achieve the state of our performance as well as the fastest processing time. Move to our third specific aim for subtype grading. Uh, we want to support uh, clinical random controlled trials as well as the uh, further studies. Therefore, we're trying to identify eight common subtypes in our data set. 
and uh, we classify each of the subtype as a positive sample versus all the rest of the subtypes. What that means, for example, in the experiment that we identify sparse G3, we're trying to identify that versus all the rest of uh, subtypes. We use the material from uh, a cohort of 25 patients, including 92 uh, HOMA tissue sections or images were many annotated by a GU pathologist. And those, those uh, data set of the annotation is done by our Ontario collaborator. And here shows the annotation by them with the legend of each of the subtypes. We used the uh, Alex Nair trained by raw image to, uh, on these uh, experiments. And here shows the overall performance. It's a little bit different from the bar chart that I showed earlier. Uh, the different color of the bars represents different error metrics, as you can see in the legend here. And, uh, and we can see uh, for the AUC bars of the blue-purple bars, um, showing the general performance, it is very promising performance at most uh, six of the eight uh, uh, experiments, we achieved AUC higher than 0.7. Uh, however, there are two subtypes we have much worse performance, as you can see here. Uh, we speculate and maybe this is due to the different sample size we use for different subtypes. However, when we uh, plot the sample size that we're using here, we found that those two subtypes are not necessarily have the smallest, the smallest uh, sample size here, whereas those three samples, they have like a much smaller sample size, however, better performance achieved. So we speculate this is probably due to the patterns of these uh, of these subtypes. And I want to highlight the package G3. You can see the performance is the worst for the package G3. And based on our further analysis in our data set, I'm not going to give the detail here in terms of time. Um, we know that the package G3, a lot of times, is being mislabeled as a small fuse of the G4. And I just draw some examples, as you can see from our whole mount of the sample of PAC G3 and small fuse G4. And those two patterns, uh, they're very similar in terms of uh, uh, the Gleason pattern. And we can see that a lot of cases, small fuse G4 is actually developing from PAC G3 as um, some of the glands starting to fuse together. So these two patterns are very similar and are very hard to differentiate. And that's probably why we have much worse performance for PAC G3. And I think of in a future study, further engineering effort is needed. Um, after sharing all that, and uh, we have a lot of limitations in, in our study, including we only use a, the data set from single center, use one pathology the annotation that limit, limits the variability of our data set. And we use fixed ROI size, as well as uh, we only invested limited numbers of uh, methods. And uh, we only segment three different tissue, uh, tissue components. There are so many different tissue components we can segment maybe yield a better performance. And the conclusion is that deep learning seems like a better than conventional machine learning based approach. And uh, I think pathological understanding is very important for designing the algorithm to deal with, to deal with specific problems. And the validation design and data analysis is essential for translational application. Last, I would acknowledge all the my supervisor and all the collaborators and uh, lab members and my previous lab members. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'd like to take any questions.